Welcome to part two of Deduction Cliff Notes. And before we begin, I just want to give a big congratulations to Logan Portnier from the channel Observe, who, as you guys know, I have worked with for a long time, from doing video collaborations to podcasting. We have kind of been in this together as the two primary YouTubers, I guess you would say, in this sort of deduction field. And he has just recently broken 100,000 subscribers. So. Big congratulations to him, and uh, yeah, let's get on with the video. As I said in the last video, I often get asked questions about what, where one should begin with learning deduction. And because I get asked that question so much, I put together a playlist on my channel called Bare Bones Beginner's Guide, with some of my best hits from the back catalog surrounding the basic fundamentals of deduction. Recently, however, as I explained in the previous video, I wanted to revamp that idea of a playlist for beginners covering the basics, and this time I want to just do three videos, three all-encompassing, in-depth, but still beginner level videos. The last one was on observation. Be the last time we talk about observation for a very long time. This time we're going to talk about memory, and the next time we're going to be talking about logical principles. So, as we discussed in the previous video, I believe that deduction comes down to three fundamental skill sets. Observation, memory, and the informed use of logical faculties. As I said before, last time we went over observation, and today we're going to be going over memory. But before we jump into everything, I want to give a big thank you to Audible. They are the leading provider of audiobooks and other audio material, including podcasts, Audible originals, and comedy. And obviously I don't need to explain all this to you because you've seen a million Audible ads, but here's another one. An Audible membership will give you a credit every month that you can spend on any audiobook you like, and you can save up those credits, which are good for a whole year, and then binge my books whenever you want, like I like to do, whenever you're in the mood, really. And right now, if you use the link in the description, audibletrial.com slash deduction, you will get a 30-day free trial membership with Audible, and be able to get a free audiobook of your choice, just from the get-go, which you can listen to on just about any of your devices. This week, I recommend getting Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking by Malcolm Gladwell. I just recently finished listening to this audiobook, and I'm a huge fan of how Gladwell can consolidates the field of psychology into in an accurate way, but also in a way that is still palatable to the layman. Even my psychology professors have touted Gladwell's work as one of the best examples of how science communication in the field of psychology should be. This book details the power of the subconscious mind, intuition, subconscious problem solving, as well as nonverbal communication and reading, and failures in the subconscious's ability to process information. Again, to grab your free audiobook and to start your 30-day free trial, use the link in the description, audibletrial.com slash deduction, to let Audible know you came from this video. So with all that out of the way, let's get down to brass tacks, shall we? When having a discussion about memory, we need to distinguish natural memory from memory systems or mnemonics. The human brain has an estimated storage capacity of up to 4 petabytes or more. The true amount is unknown. A number that is roughly equivalent to the entire Encyclopedia Britannica 12 times over. Now, when we talk about natural memory, we have to keep in mind that while the brain has such a massive storage capacity, it maintains extreme efficiency with what goes in from the working memory to the long-term memory. This is what makes it difficult to remember things that are not obviously important to survival. Repetition is key for making something a part of your natural memory and is the basis of each memory system that we use in some form or another. When we talk about memory systems, particularly visual systems such as the famed Mind Palace, we need to understand a function of the brain that occurs when one uses a visual memory system, which I believe is the reason why they are so effective and that is something I like to call simultaneous repetition. Auditory sequential repetition, reciting something over and over again, is known to work for committing something to memory. However, visual systems achieve the same effect more quickly and with less sequential repetition. The reason for this is that the auditory process takes less cortical space than visual processing because auditory information is translated from a smaller number of information units than visual information. When crafting a visual image in your head, you are creating a neurological environment where the working memory must interact with the visual systems in the form of visual memory and imagination. Visual images used in memory systems are designed to be as distinctive as possible, which in turn involves more and more cortical regions for the processing of it. Essentially, you're repeating the information multiple times at multiple parts of your brain, creating the effect of repetition in a singular moment. 
There are multiple visual memory systems that all work on this basic principle, creating a bizarre image in your head that reminds you of the thing that you are trying to remember. Where they differ is how they lead you back to this information. It makes little difference if you can imagine an image that reminds you of a piece of information if you can't recall that image at will. Each of these differing visual systems give you a visual cue that you can go back to and that will lead you back to the information that you've committed to the memory system. While the Mind Palace is the best for remembering a large quantity of things for a long period of time, each of these visual memory systems we'll cover leading up to the Mind Palace will serve as foundations for how to use the Mind Palace. First of all, pegging. Pegging is a visual memory system where you create visual mnemonics or pegs for numbers and then associate items you are trying to remember with those numbers. Mnemonics from 1 to 10 that I use are as follow. 1 is a gun, 2 is a shoe, 3, tree, 4, door, 5, hive like a beehive, 6, tricks, 7, heaven, 8, plate, 9, mine like a coal mine, and 10 den, like a lion's den. Now this system is good for committing numbered lists that you don't need to remember forever to memory such as a grocery list, or in situations where you need to recall an item at random based off of the number that it appears in the list rather than going strictly in order. Uh, an example of this would be like if you're doing a mentalist show, let's say, because I know some of you want to take this skill set into the performing arts. Um, let's say you have a, a mentalist show where you have Memorize a list of items given to you by members of the audience. Then you have one member of the audience call out numbers, and you answer back with the item that corresponds to it. You can go beyond just 10, obviously, and in theory you can have an infinite number of pegs associated with the numbers. If you pick up Ben Cardle's book, The Monographs, he has uh, pegs for up to 100. Um, but the first 10 are here to get you started, and ultimately comes down to how well you associate it with. The system that I use for 1 through 10 is good for me because it rhymes and that immediately gets me thinking about it. 1, I think immediately gun, and then whatever I have pictured in my head with that visual of a gun is the thing that I'm trying to remember. And so it gives me a way to get back to that information. So let me give an, a practical example of how you would actually use it. Um, so let's say you have a grocery list where the first item is a carrot. Uh, think one, gun. So imagine a gun and associate that with carrots. Perhaps imagine a gun made of carrots that also shoots out carrots. The crazier and more bizarre the image, the better you will be able to remember it. And then you go down the list. Uh, the next item is eggs. Uh, Think of shoes filled with eggs, so two shoe eggs, you know, you're sticking your foot into that shoe and you're cracking the eggs and you're getting egg all over your feet, which is, I'm told, no fun. Okay, so the second memory system is linking. Linking is similar to pegging in that it is used to craft semi-permanent memory for a list of objects or concepts. However, rather than associating these items with numbers, you associate them with each other, in essence, linking them. Let's say we have a list to memorize that follows. Um, pencil, coffee cup, glasses, calculator, Rubik's cube, wallet. Using the link system, we would begin by visually combining the first two items, pencil and coffee cup. Imagine, let's say, a giant pencil with an eraser shaped like a coffee cup. Again, the more bizarre the image, the better. Then you combine the second two items coffee cup and glasses. Perhaps imagine a person whose head is a coffee cup where the handle of the coffee cup is their nose and they're struggling to balance their glasses on the handle and progress with the rest of the list. Next come into glasses and calculator and then calculator and Rubik's cube and then Rubik's cube and wallet. Each item on the list is associated with two items, the one preceding it and the one following it. Like each link in a chain connects with the other two links, except for the first and last items, which each only link up to one other item, the following one and the preceding one, respectively. This memory technique is good when you need to memorize a list in order, and I've personally used the system to memorize things like scripts, um, visually representing the words and phrases and linking them together, since they must proceed in the same way every time. The journey system is the basis of the mind palace, but on a smaller scale. With the peg system, you use numbers as your way to find your way back to the information you're memorizing. And in the linking system, you use the items themselves as associations to lead you back. With the journey system, you use a physical space, be it a room, a desk, or a street. The catch to this 
it is that you must proceed in the environment using the same journey every time. Otherwise, your memory of the environment will be variable and you will be incapable of reliably using the space. For your first journey, don't get too detailed. Stay with the big items to use as your pegs, things like big furniture pieces, wall ornaments, and figure out where you want to start. Usually the entrance of the room works best, and then pick items that you will use as pegs, and then walk through that room, stopping at each item that you're using as pegs in order. At each item, stop and deeply observe it, searing the image of the peg into your mind. Look at it for no less than 10 seconds. Once you've completed your journey, return to the starting place, close your eyes, and mentally re-walk the journey that you just physically walked in your mind. Repeat this process five times at least per journey. I usually put a cap at 25 pegs per building session. If a room exceeds 25 pegs, then simply go through the first 25 five times, and then as you build out from there, go to the next 25, starting at your 25th peg and then moving on to the 26th. That way the continuity between the two sections of the room is still there. Make sense? Okay, great. And now finally, to close out this video, the fabled Mind Palace, the method of loci. The memory or Mind Palace is over 2,000 years old, or older depending on who you ask, and prior to the invention of the printing press, most people in the West and possibly in other areas of the world employed it. It is essentially identical to the journey system, just on a larger scale. To build a mind palace, you must have multiple rooms, each with a journey. As you become more adept at building rooms in your mind palace, you can become more detailed using smaller items as pegs, rather than only using large furniture pieces. This system will enable you to store memories for a long period of time, however it is not permanent. Maintenance of your mind palace is key, and this is something that a lot of people don't talk about and a lot of people gloss over. Your mind palace isn't going to work like it does in the Sherlock BBC show. It has to be maintained and you have to go through it the same way every time. Now, the way that I maintain a mind palace is I break the mind palace into seven quadrants and review one quadrant every day of the week. If you have seven rooms in your palace, review one room every day. If you have 14, review two rooms a day, etc. This maintenance not only helps you keep the mind palace functionally useful by keeping the memories from fading and thus allowing you to retrieve those memories when you need them, but also the constant maintenance forces you to review each piece of information continually, which means that inevitably those memories stored in your mind palace will be integrated into your natural memory, negating the need for you to even have to go into the mind palace to retrieve it. Essentially, the Mind Palace is not a permanent storage facility, but rather a halfway house to your natural memory, as my friend Ben Cardell likes to say. And with that, we've gone over the basics of memory. When it comes to using visual memory systems, you want them to be natural for you to use. Almost a second nature. That way, at any moment, you can commit an item to memory and use it later. To achieve that, it is best to drill and practice those first three memory techniques to get the core mechanisms of visual memory down pat. That way, once you have a mind palace, you can add something to a room at the drop of a hat and within a conversation even. And even after you do get a mind palace up and running, those more reduced memory techniques will still prove useful. Personally, I use I used to interrupt people a lot during conversation, a habit that was readily apparent in the first few episodes of Mind Reader that I did with Logan, where I was almost constantly interrupting him. Editing those episodes made me see how bad a habit that was, and so I decided to try and correct that using memory systems. What I do now to prevent myself from interrupting people while still not forgetting the thing I want to say is if I have a thought in the conversation, I'll use the peg system to quickly make a mental note not to forget the thing that I want to say so that when the other person has come to a natural conclusion of their thought, I can say what I have to say without interrupting their thought. It's vastly improved the podcast as well as conversations in my personal life. So you can see how creative uses of these memory systems can serve you in many areas of life. Now, in the final episode of this mini-series, coming very soon, we will finally tackle the issue of what is deduction? As we cover the three logical avenues we use in the process we colloquially call deduction. So, with all that being said, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to follow the link in the description for a free audiobook and a 30 day free trial. And once again, thank you to all of you deductionists for watching. So, as always, Arrivederci.